Good evening. Great to see you tonight. Why don't you stand with me? As it's raining out there, there's no better place to be than in here. And we get to start with singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' Name. That's great singing. You can be seated tonight. Welcome you to People's Baptist Church. And for all those that are joining us by way of live stream, we're glad that you're with us this evening as well. And uh, I um, am thrilled that we can still continue on our big picture Bible study. Just so many positive comments about it. And uh, people are really getting to see the big picture. And I think tonight you're probably going to connect some more dots. And it's just been a healthy time together. Let me give you a couple of quick announcements. Uh, tomorrow we will still have another day of prayer from 8 o'clock in the morning till 6. The doors here in this auditorium will be open. And uh, we're asking you to come and consider praying for God to give us wisdom about developing uh, some plans and about developing a plan for a family life center and uh, we're also considering uh, and praying whether or not the Lord would have us to uh, to be come available before that could happen but we want the Lord's will and uh, this past week I was praying and I will tell you it's been so good in these times of prayer uh, how the Lord speaks to your heart and I really think he, he, it was one of those light bulb moments in my heart uh, as I was praying specifically about some things it was almost like the Lord said well you know you could do this and I'm like well Lord that's just a wonderful thought thank you for that and you know it's another thing to cast before the Lord and that's the reason we're doing that we're asking him for divine wisdom so join with us and as we do that you can just come and go at your leisure and uh, like I say eight until six tomorrow and then next Wednesday night is going to be a completely different format next Wednesday uh, we are not going to have a, uh, a big picture Bible study in here but let me tell you what we are going to be doing we have uh, we had put together several thousand uh, Easter invites for our church and so next Wednesday, we are going to ask you to do consider doing a couple of things. In the next, we've got two days lined up. One, the first one is this next Wednesday. We're going to ask you to consider helping us going and blitzing a certain area of our community. And really, we're just going to go to some houses and just drop off a brochure and uh, invite people to come to our Easter service. Uh, we have some that are door hangers in case there's no one there. And uh, we've got the, we have maps that will be um, with, with different color codes on them for streets to cover. And uh, we want you to be a part of that. If for some reason, and I understand there are some of you that visit physically cannot do that and we understand that uh, we're going to have in here as others are going out a concentrated time of prayer uh, as we think about our Easter services and so that is what our big push will be next week next week our GCA is out a lot of our teachers will be traveling a lot of our school families will take a little break that week as well but
But next Wednesday night is a big, big Easter blitz, so please plan on that. And then our big services for Easter, schedule's a little bit different this year, but we're going to have an 8 a.m. sunrise service. It's kind of delayed sunrise. It's like sunrise for Baptist, all right? And so that'll be outside. And then we will, at 9 o'clock, we'll have a church-wide breakfast. And then our morning service this year will be at 10 a.m. And it'll be one worship service instead of Sunday school. Uh, we'll just do the one service. And then right after that, we are doing a community-wide uh, Easter egg hunt. And we're trying our best to uh, get some lost people here so they can hear the gospel. And I hope that you will pray for that uh, day. There's just a lot of effort going into that. And so we uh, need your help in getting some of the items together for the breakfast. So we've got some sign-up sheets out in the foyer. If you can bring some of these breakfast items, uh, it'll tell you. You can drop them off on Wednesday, April the 13th, and uh, that'll help. We've got teams already put together, different ones volunteering. I just appreciate this church so much. Uh, that's going to be their ministry of that day, and we appreciate it. We uh, are grateful that things are opening back up now. We can take some missions trips, and we have missed that tremendously, and so we have several of the trips that are available. Uh, some are medical trips. Some are more construction-type trips. Uh, all of them have an evangelistic component to it, but if you have any interest in doing that, uh, stop and see what's available. And we want you to go with us. And then we have uh, some more brochures. I guess we ran out of brochures for the Israel trip on Sunday, but there's some more out there. The trip's filling up. We're, I think we're up somewhere around 37, 38 right now that have turned things in. And I think we're going to be over 40 uh, here in the next few, uh, few days. So if you would like to go, there's still room for you. And so those brochures are out there. How many have been every night for a big picture? Let me see your hand. Wow, that's wonderful. How many have caught up over the internet by going back and look them at it. Yeah, there you go. That's the good thing about it. I, I was talking to someone this week, and they are in another ministry next door while we're doing this, and they said, but I have been watching online, and I have been using the digital format to print my copy of, of uh, the notes off, and so it's really working out well, and don't you think Brother Ains has done a good job? He's just done it. Do this. Just let him know you appreciate that as he comes to share God's word with us. All right. Thank you, Pastor, for that. And it's been a privilege to be able to be a part of it and to study. Um, that is something that I thoroughly enjoy and uh, appreciate your faithfulness. Tonight, we're on lesson number nine. And if you need a handout, Brother Jerry is here. Just raise your hand if there's anybody that needs a handout um, to fill in the blanks. And um, we'll look forward to what the Lord has for us this evening. I was telling Pastor before the service, I went away Sunday night. Man, my heart was filled. That was just tremendous to think about all the young people and the children that were involved in that service. And just to visualize, hey, they're just going to they're gonna go from here to the choir, to the orchestra, to Sunday school classes. And uh, that's exciting to think about, that there'll be no gaps there as, uh, as we have kids that have participated. And it's good for them. You know, Pastor said it's not easy to get up here, and I can attest to that. And, uh, and I'm serious when I say this, that, that um, there is a lot of times when I come up here and I realize I cannot do this. And that's a good thing, to realize I can't do this. And uh, I've taken on the theme, yet not I, but Christ in me. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And uh, so tonight, with that in mind, I'm going to invite you uh, to bow your head and let's pray. Let's ask for the Lord's help this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And we thank you for um, the fact that we can study it and uh, we can dig out truths from your word and feel like uh, that we have minded all only to come to a service and hear another message, another lesson, and realize the depths of your word. We thank you for that. It's no ordinary book, and I pray tonight we would not treat it as an ordinary book, but we would treat it as your word to us. And so I pray you'd help us as we study that we might become familiar, more familiar with your word, and be found more faithful. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, here we are. We're looking at the big picture. For some of you, maybe you haven't been here for all of the sessions and you wonder, what is the big picture? What we're trying to do is to look at the Old Testament in its entirety from uh, an altitude of, say, 10,000 feet. And so what we mean by that is we're not going into a lot of detail on purpose because it would take an awful lot of time. What we're trying to do is just introduce a lot of these themes. And many of you are very familiar with this information and you could stand here and you could give the information out as well. So it's not, it's not as though that uh, all of this information is brand new, but sometimes it's good for us to be reminded of what we do know and say, and it's encouraging to be able to say, yes, I know that, I've been taught that uh, about God's word. So. This week, we're covering lesson number nine. Next week, as Pastor mentioned, we will take a break. And then two weeks from tonight, we'll be back in lesson number 10, and that will be a lesson on exile, the exile uh, time for the nation of Israel and Judah. So uh, if we look at our drone shot tonight, we're looking at the city of London. And uh, it's a beautiful city. There's the Thames, the and uh, you can see maybe, I don't know if you can identify, there's the Parliament building and Big Ben uh, there. And, uh, but that green part right there is, of course, Buckingham Palace. So if you look at our lesson tonight, we're talking about kings and monarchs. And so we kind of naturally, very close to Great Britain, we kind of naturally think about uh, Great Britain and the fact that they have a queen and we don't. And uh, we gained our independence, and uh, we developed a different system of government, obviously. But just to give you an idea, this is the Royal Palace of Buckingham. And it's only one of 23 palaces that she has, bless her heart. And uh, what's going on here is what's called the changing of the guard. And every day at 11 o'clock, weather permitting, then uh, these guards come in. They're the sentries, if you recognize, you know, the outfits, the red outfits and the bearskin hats, and they do a little ceremony. I say weather permitting because if it is even a hint of rain, they cancel the ceremony because each one of those outfits is $40,000. Can you imagine? So no wonder they don't want it out in the weather. So that's where the queen lives. And uh, Queen Elizabeth, she's 95 years old. She is celebrating her, uh, what they call her platinum jubilee. And either uh, she will continue to reign until she passes away or until she abdicates the throne and steps down. In that case, of course, her son, Prince Charles, will take the throne. But uh, she was born in 1926, but in June of 1953, she was in Africa with her husband when she got news that her father, Edward VI, had passed away suddenly. She had a few days to get back to England and prepare for a coronation ceremony, which was a big event. Can you imagine at the age of 27 taking over the British Empire and the weight of the shoulder uh, on her shoulders? She actually said that the crown was so heavy on her head that she had to wear it so long that day that, it, of course, it gave her a headache. Uh, and I thought, well, that's not the last headache that you would have as the Queen of England. They've had some rough days, haven't they? But, you know, uh, her role is primarily ceremonial. She doesn't run the government. She meets officials, and uh, she will go and cut the ribbon uh, of uh, maybe a brand-new hospital or a, something, a new school or something along that line. It's, it's strictly ceremonial. The only time she actually has official business is once a year when she opens Parliament, and she goes and she reads kind of a, an abbreviated State of the Union, Address to the House of Lords, the House of Lords there in the Parliament. And she never goes into the House of Commons. Those are common people, and she doesn't mix with them. Instead, she stays in the House of the Lords and gives, uh, and gives her speech. But you know, uh, there are about 43 countries in the world that have monarchs. A majority of them uh, are ceremonial. They might be referred to as a king or a queen. A prince, princess, emperor, empress. They have different titles, dukes, duchesses. But they're mostly ceremonial. There are a few that are in power and have absolute control. But Elizabeth, being the oldest reigning monarch, as I mentioned, she's 95 years old. The youngest is the emir of Qatar. And that's over in the Gulf. Uh, a lot of oil money. And here he was hosting uh, former president uh, 
uh, Donald Trump uh, in his sandals, which is kind of amusing to us here in the West, right? That he's wearing his Crocs uh, when the President of the United States shows up. But uh, what we're talking about is the eras. So the reason I mention all this about kings and such and emirs is because we're talking about the kingdom era. This is and uh, we also look at the arc of history. We have number one there, the creation. And then we have uh, the uh, patriarchs, that's Abraham. Then they go to Egypt. And then uh, the exodus from Egypt. Number four was the conquest. That's what Mr. Rice covered. Last week we covered the judges. That's number five with the gavel. And tonight we look at the crown, the kingdom era uh, of Israel's history. So this is lesson nine. And we are talking about the kingdom era. We're going to cover, in essence, what is found in six books of the Old Testament. Six historical books. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. Um, but can I remind you from lesson one that first and second Chronicles are secondary historical books. There are primary historical books and secondary. There are 11 primary historical books in the Old Testament. There are six secondary historical books. And uh, that does not mean that they're not important. They are of no less importance. But what it does, the emphasis, is to either amplify stories or to repeat stories for emphasis that has already been covered in previous books. And so First and Second Chronicles is the kingdom era, uh, concludes the kingdom era. You know, by nature, man desires something he cannot have. And that's total freedom. Man wants to be able to make their own rules and live the way they want to live and then expect the consequences to go their favor. Wouldn't you agree with that? A lot of people are upset when that doesn't happen. But that's just not reality. Reality is we live in a sinful world and there are consequences to our choices uh, that, we may, that we make. There are certain freedoms we can have, but there are also corresponding bondages. And there are certain bondages that we can have that may afford us corresponding freedoms. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, you know, this is not my favorite time of the year, to be honest with you. Spring is not number one. I love the fall. I like it when the humidity goes away a little bit here in eastern North Carolina, starts to cool off in the evenings. The leaves start to change. It's a beautiful time of the year. Uh, it's football season, amen? And then uh, Thanksgiving comes up. I mean, it's just wonderful. It's great. This time of the year, I don't know what it is. I think some of it is this. And before that happens, I start to feel it. I don't know if it's the barometric pressure. I don't understand all that. But all I know is my head gets clogged up. And a few days later, all, you know, all the yellow begins to rain down. This afternoon, going home, I was sloshing yellow all over my windshield. And uh, everybody's car is yellow this time of the year. All right? But here's my point. My point is that every year, I manage a bumper crop of weeds in my yard and it comes up about this time of the year now probably that's because I didn't invest in some kind of weed and feed that I should have put on back in the fall at the end of the mowing season maybe that would take care of it but this is what I grow this time of the year and it's almost as though I go out in the yard and plant it and trust me I don't um, and then, of course, the grass begins to, to grow and turn green. And, uh, and then we put out some kind of fertilizer, some weed and feed. And, uh, and then pretty soon that stuff goes away, right? But my point is that we can be free from yard work in the spring and just say, I'm not going to do anything. And I'm just going to live with the consequences. And you're going to have weeds in your yard if you do that, right? That just makes sense. On the other hand... You can be like some people and a slave to their yard. Man, they, they love their yard. It's their pride and joy. And they go out there and, and they'll um, use a sprinkler and uh, they spread weed and feed and they pull out the dandelions and uh, they do all kinds of things in an effort to, to get rid of the weeds so they can have a, a yard that looks like this, right? Wow, that's pretty impressive. I've never had a yard look like that. Uh, that's on the side of the fertilizer bag, by the way. All right, that's not reality. Here's the point. The point is that, you've heard this phrase, you can have your cake and eat it too. Have you ever heard that phrase? You know, the, I didn't know this, but the original phrase was, uh, actually, you can't have your, uh, you can't eat your cake and have it too. 
And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you have your cake and you eat it, you're not going to have any more left, is what it comes down to. But the point is, with this, just by way of illustration, is that people want it both ways. They want to be able to have total freedom. And that's not, I mean, that's not possible. Here's an example of what people say. This is just a quote, generic quote. The boss wants to be everyone's friend in the office while still having their respect and compliance, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. We would know what that means, right? You can't have it both ways. You're either going to be a friend or you're going to be a leader, uh, but you can't do both. If you, if you do that, it causes confusion, et cetera, et cetera. All right? Good. We understand what that is. That kind of freedom, total freedom, does not exist in our world. We live in a world that has the consequences of sin, and we realize that on a daily basis. With privilege, as we all know, comes responsibility. And we try to teach that to our children. We try to teach that to our young people. You want freedom? Show some responsibility. The more responsibility you show, the more freedom that I can give you. That makes sense, right? That formula. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Throughout life, we're constantly making choices. And for those choices, we pay certain inescapable consequences. A lot of times, it's a very good consequence. And we're pleased with what decisions we made because of the outcome. But then how many times have you heard people say, if I could go back to the day when dot, 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 fill in the blank. And they would say, you know what? I made a terrible mistake that day. If I could go back, and we can't. We have to live with the consequences. And the nation of Israel had to live with the consequences. You know, in Washington, D.C., on the 4th of July, they have a big parade. And the guys that dress up, they look like colonial soldiers. They've got the triangular hat. They've got the uniform. They've got the muskets with the fixed bayonets. And uh, they're in a parade. And it reminds us of what it was like for our nation to gain the freedom that we have to fight in our war for independence. But you know, if you drive about three hours away, there's a place called Valley Forge that you're familiar with. It's just outside of Philadelphia. And I would encourage you, if you haven't been there, to take the time to go. It's a very sobering place. And uh, I've been there before when it was just nice and sunshine and green grass in the summertime. But the last time we were there, which is probably three or four years ago, it was just my wife and I. And we drove through the park, and it was a freezing cold day. It was one of those days where, wow, you didn't have to be outside very long at all before. You just felt chilled, and you wanted to get back in your car. You had enough time to get out, take a few pictures, and get right back in the car. And I was glad we were there that day. Because it reminded me of the winter of 1777-1778. When at the lowest point in our nation's history, we had some resolve on the part of the men who were there at Valley Forge. And they had all kinds of problems. They didn't have enough food. They certainly did not have enough clothing. They did not have shoes. Some of them did not. They had rags wrapped around their, their feet. And we're talking about freezing temperatures. And here's what's amazing. That's only 20 miles from Philadelphia, and many of them had their but they stayed. A few days later, they crossed the Delaware River, if you remember, with George Washington, and they marched nine miles, and they captured uh, the German Hessians and overtook them, and uh, that was a turning point in the war for the United States, for our independence. Now, every student in U.S. public schools and private schools, I believe, should take a trip and go visit Valley Forge. The winter of 1777-1778 would show, hey, our nation, there were people that made sacrifices to give us the freedom to be able to do what we do. You see, with the bondage came some freedom, and we're enjoying the freedom that they sacrificed when they could have gone home. You know who was in their homes? Living in their homes, the Quartering Act, were British soldiers. And they had to keep them in their home, and they had to pay for them. So what are you trying to say, Mr. Ains? Well, uh, in that same battlefield park right there, Valley Forge, is a beautiful chapel. And if you go inside, there's all kinds of tributes saying thank you to George Washington and to our soldiers who persevered during that extreme winter. And the stained glass windows and all the insignia, they can tell you all the significance of that as you go through there. And we realize that there are consequences. Freedom comes with a price. And we would say to them, thanks for not giving up. Thanks for not quitting. It would have been very easy to do that. The kings of Israel wanted total freedom. They wanted the freedom to ignore the directives that God had given. 
and uh, on how to wage, uh, uh, how to rule over the nation and how to wage war. We've got this, God. We've got our own land now. It was almost as though they were saying, we can take care of this, all right? We'll handle it from this point on. And how mistaken that they were. At the same time, they wanted the freedom to have economic and military prosperity. You see, they wanted their cake, and they wanted to be able to eat it as well. And uh, the truth is that the nation of Israel gave up uh, a privilege that they had for God to be their king because they wanted a human king, even though Samuel tried to warn them. This resulted in many turbulent times in the kingdom era. It's so significant that when a righteous ruler was in power, things would go well. There was prosperity. When the unrighteous king gained the throne, the nation would falter, get into trouble. You know, um, this verse comes to mind, Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. It's a true statement. There are consequences to elections, aren't there? And uh, we're feeling that this evening. So let's take a look at this. After many years of ups and downs, the nation of Israel collapsed. And they suffered at the hands of foreign leaders. And so by way of review, let's go back and we'll look at this. And uh, we've been looking at the era and the figure and the location and the storyline summary. But tonight, let's just look at the, the people. Let's specifically look at the second column. You've got Adam and Abraham and Moses and Joshua. And last week we had Samson. And tonight, of course, we're talking about David. David is our figure that represents the kingdom era. The location, of course, is Israel. And let's fill in the blank on our storyline summary. What is this whole lesson about? It can be summed up in this one statement. It's a long one. David, the greatest king in the new monarchy, is followed by a succession of mostly unrighteous kings. Eventually, uh, and God eventually judges Israel. There are consequences, and they end up going into exile. And we'll follow that up two weeks from tonight with lesson number 10. But what we're concentrating on tonight are four main eras. I'll give you a chance to fill in the blanks here. I don't want to get too far. There's three things to fill in there. Let's expand it. You notice how there's a pattern. We've been expanding things in four ways in the actual lesson. Well, tonight it's pretty simple. Uh, in the four main periods of the kingdom era, you have the United Kingdom, and then you have the Divided Kingdom. And we've heard that phrase for a long time. Uh, Sunday school lessons and preaching, the mention of the, of the term United Kingdom and Divided Kingdom. We may or may not know exactly what that is. And then number three is the Northern Kingdom, followed up by number four, and that's the Southern Kingdom. So the four main eras or periods in talking about kings, one, two, three, four, united, divided, and then the southern, the northern, excuse me, and then the southern. So let's concentrate on the first one, and that is the United Kingdom. This is a new monarchy, and this is covered in 1 Samuel and in 2 Samuel primarily, and in this time frame, if you remember, our cartoon of 1 Samuel is one sand mule, all right, and this is Saul. Man, he's packed, didn't he? He's head and shoulders above his peers. He was strong physically, but boy, he had some problems right off the bat. And God had to remove him off the throne. You notice he has no heart for God, and that was part of the that was the problem. That wasn't part of the problem. That was the problem. That's first sand mule, all right? Two sand mules is David. And David made some mistakes in his life for sure. But he had a heart after God, and God used him. So he has a heart for God. He has his harp there and he has his sling. It represents King David, one sand mule and two sand mules. All right? Now here's the deal. The 12 tribes of Israel were jealous of other nations around them and they're united in their demand to God for a king. This is one thing that the entire group of people had consent and that was, we want a human king. And even though they didn't think about the consequences of that and, and what was going to happen down the road as a result of having a human king. All they knew was, this is what I want. It's almost like a kid. Remember the kids in uh, 
that would, would say, you know, mom and dad, this is what I want, and they kept bugging you about it until finally we relent sometimes, and we get them what they want, only to find out that it's disposed of in a short period of time. Just wasn't all that it was cracked up to be, right? We understand that. In 1992, Gatorade came up with one of the best advertising slogans of all time. And this is 30 years ago, so some of you won't remember this, but some of us remember uh, Gatorade and their advertising of, I want to be like Mike. Does that sound familiar? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, three of us. <laughs> Four. I want to be like Mike. There was a song, and it was a commercial, and it showed Michael Jordan in various, uh, of course, he won six national championships with the Chicago Bulls during that time. Very, very successful. Just to give you an idea, that pair of shoes right there that he wore uh, sold for $31,000. Yeah, I want to be like Mike, too. I'd love to sell my shoes at $31,000. All right, what are we talking about here, though? I want to be like Mike, an imitation. We want to be like the people around us, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites. They all have a human king. Why can't we have a human king? And the idea is we want to keep up with the Joneses, right? You've heard that phrase. And uh, I don't know where that came from. Uh, Rose and Dwayne Jones are in my Sunday school class, and I give them a hard time about, man, I'm just trying to keep up with you guys, all right? I want to keep up with the Joneses. And uh, they're great people. What does that mean? Well, you know, it's the idea that, hey, if the Joneses get a larger house, we got to have a larger house. If they have three-car garage, we have to have a three-car garage. We only have one car, but we need three-car garage. They have an outdoor swimming pool. We need an outdoor. We need an in-ground swimming pool. We want to keep up with the Joneses. And really, that's very similar to the attitude that the nation of Israel had about leadership. Samuel tried to tell him, you realize that if you get a human king, you know what's going to happen? Your taxes are going to go way up. Somebody's got to pay for that. And you know, I'd be, I, it would be difficult for me to be a British citizen and to pay high taxes knowing that the queen and her family are acting the way they are and living the way they are. Okay, I can say that because I'm not British, okay? Uh, I've often said, you know what they need to do? They just need to go out and get a job. That would help them. That would give them something to do. They have nothing to do. Ever so often they cut a ribbon uh, and they show up and it's a ceremonial thing. But they're bored. They get in trouble. They should just get a job. Barnes & Noble is hiring, okay? Can you imagine King Charles there at Barnes & Noble? So he said, hey, you're going to have high taxes. Your taxes ra tax rate's going to go up. Is that what you want? Oh, yeah, that's okay. That, that's fine. You don't realize what you're getting yourself into. Hey, you know what? Your daughters, the king is likely to make alliances with other foreign nations, and so he's going to expect you to give up your daughters and let them marry into theirs, into their families, and then vice versa. Your sons here are going to have to marry their daughters, and guess what? They're going to bring their false gods with them, and that's exactly what they did. Your sons, by the way, will go off to war as a result of this, this alliance. Number one, God allows Samuel, the last judge, to anoint Saul to be the first king. Beginning a new monarchy. Boy, they thought they were just like the Joneses and we're off to a good start here as a nation. And then, you know, Saul turns out to be an unrighteous king. He does not do what God asks him to do. He disobeys. He tries to cover his sin. So God does not honor his reign or establish his throne uh, or his family on the throne of Israel. It's no coincidence that the nation of Israel tonight does not have the flag with the star of Saul on it. He, he, he blew it. His successor, though, was David. And even though he had shortcomings, we mentioned that. David was not a perfect man by any stretch. But he was transparent with God. We benefit from that by looking at the book of Psalms throughout. And he is a righteous king. And Israel prospers under his leadership. This is the peak. This is the golden era of Israel. This is the Pax Romana. Boy, they prospered like no other time when they were under the reign of David. So much so that I mentioned the flag of Israel, blue and white. The blue representing God's glory, purity, and God's severity. In the blue, the white is representative of divine benevolence. And I didn't know this, but they chose those colors to represent the prayer shawls that they wear as they don, that they don, that they put on, in this case, at the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. David's son, wow, we're going through so much at one time here. I realize that. 
we can't slow down. We just got to keep moving here. We're just, we're just taking aerial shots, so hang on. David's son Solomon becomes king upon David's death. And he rules righteously at first, and then he drifts from the Lord. And uh, it's really an interesting study to see the life of Solomon. You remember God came to Solomon and said, I'll give you whatever you want. What do you want? He didn't ask for fame or didn't ask for wealth, didn't ask for um, uh, great lands and uh, a bunch of favors for his family. But he said, I need wisdom. And then the sad thing is, towards the latter part of his life, he realized, I didn't use that wisdom like I could have. You know, the, uh, the result is number two, is we come to the divided kingdom. And the divided kingdom is a time frame here when they had a civil war. In 1 Kings, everything breaks apart. When Solomon dies, the kingdoms break into two, if you remember. And you know, in our own country, in the uh, civil war, that four-year period, 1861, 1865, do you know we had 600,000 people that died in that war? And uh, not all from bullets or from uh, cannon fire, but from malnutrition and disease and privation and, of course, war and casualties. 600,000. But even after the war was over, you remember President Lincoln did in his second inaugural address, he talked about binding up the nation's wounds. That was foremost on his mind. A few days later, of course, his life would be taken. But there is a time of recovery, and uh, there is a time of wounds, and there is a time of reconstruction following. And for the, uh, for the nation of Israel, it would be the same. The kingdom, as a result of Solomon's spiritual drifting, a civil war erupts upon his death, and then the kingdom is split apart, never to come together. I hope I didn't move too quickly there if you'll fill in the word death. The kingdom is divided into the northern kingdom, which is the ten tribes that would be known as Israel. And this is pretty foundational, I realize. But the, uh, the, the kingdom is divided then into the southern kingdom as well. And those are two tribes, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. All right? Now that's point number two. And there's only three slides there. A few fill in the blanks. Now we're going to go on to the third section, which is the northern kingdom. And that was a time of, uh, that would be characterized by an unrighteous kingdom. And I'll explain why. In 2 Kings, we have the record of the northern kingdom. Jeroboam commands the northern kingdom of Israel. And Jeroboam is a, uh, he is unrighteous. And every other king in the northern kingdom, all 19 of them, and those who succeed him, in that 250-year period of time, were unrighteous, the Bible says. Not one of them stood up and said, you know what, we're going to go back to the fundamentals. We're going to go back to what God told uh, that we should do as a nation. Not one, but 19 of them. And as a result, God raises up a foreign power, in this case, Assyria, and Assyria would come down. The Assyrian uh, Empire was very powerful. And they had a reputation for brutalizing uh, their, their, uh, the people that they capture and putting them into slavery. They were ruthless. And so on top of the fact that they are, that they're conquered as a nation, of all people they're conquered by the Assyrians. Couldn't have been much worse. They were scattered to the four winds, our notes say. And the unrighteous kingdom is never fully restored. Assyria. Does that sound familiar? It should. If you remember back in lesson number two, remember our anchor points? All right. That's letter E there at the top near the Tigris and Euphrates. That's the Assyrian Empire. They come down to that area, which is where B is, Canaan and Israel, and they conquer it and uh, they consume it. And then we come to the last of the kingdoms. And of course, that's the southern kingdom otherwise known as Judah, and this is referred to as the inconsistent kingdom. At least there were a few righteous kings during this time. You know, the uh, northern kingdom was 0 for 19. And Rehoboam, jo uh, Solomon's son, he commands the southern kingdom of Judah. And Rehoboam is also unrighteous, but the southern kingdom fares a little bit better in their willingness to listen to God and there were a few kings, a handful of kings, that decided to do the right thing. Lasting for 400 years, its life is prolonged by eight righteous kings out of a total of 20. 
Do you see what their record is? 20 and 19 out of 39 monarchs, eight of them chose to do the right thing. And the end result is due to their disobedience, God brings judgment upon the inconsistent kingdom, the southern kingdom, by raising up Babylon. Babylon has come along, it has conquered Assyria, and now it comes down and it takes Judah. The Babylonians had earlier defeated the Assyrians. They gathered all the leaders, anybody that had promise, anybody that had talent, people that were sharp. They took the musicians, they took the artisans, they took the leaders. Now when they took them, they wanted to completely change their identity, right? We'll change your name, we'll change your, your language, we will change your culture, and we will change your God. But Daniel and the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Radio Shack, they would not... I, I was just trying to wake you up, okay? Abednego, they would not do so. They stayed faithful. But look how far they had to go, 1,700 miles into captivity. What is that? That's the anchor point, letter F. Babylonian Empire is going to take Assyria and is going to continue and take all those people over into what is called exile, and that is next week's lesson. So here's the four main subjects of the kingdom era. If we look at the United Kingdom, we would say that's number two. That's when they gained a new monarchy. Okay, Saul, brand new king. And then, and then David and then Solomon. And then the divided kingdom is when they split apart because of the civil war following the death of Solomon. Then number three there, the northern kingdom, would be the unrighteous kingdom. Not one of the kings would choose to serve God and do what is right. And then finally the southern kingdom is that time frame of the civil war. So here's filling in the blank for tonight. Kingdom, David, Israel, and David the greatest king in the monarchy is followed by a succession of mostly unrighteous kings and God eventually judges Israel by putting them into exile. And that gives us uh, an idea of what we lead into for next week. All right? Here's the five review key words. Obadiah, brother's keeper. You remember that? Obadiah, the brother's keeper. Jonah, that's an easy one. Everybody knows that one. That's fish, right? And uh, the fact he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale and then went to Nineveh and preached repentance. And then we have Micah, that's the day in court. And you have a microphone there on the left and the day of court in a courtroom setting. And then speaking of Jonah, after he had preached repentance, years later Nineveh goes back into sin and uh, the end result is a flood. And God takes the Tigris River and blows down the walls of, uh, of, uh, of Nineveh and that's under the watch of Nahum in the Old Testament, the prophet of Nahum. And then we came to Habakkuk. And this is a ha backpack with a tower with a bunch of watches on it, the watchtower. All right, we only have four that we're gonna do tonight. Why is that? In the New Testament, all right? Or, excuse me, Old Testament. We have Zephaniah, day of the Lord, not to be confused with a day uh, uh, in court. So there is a Z fanning itself, Zephaniah. And then we have Haggai and the temple. What are we going to do? We're going to hug an eye. And there's the temple. And they were so thrilled. Haggai comes back and says, Hey guys, it's been a long time. What's the deal? We have made no progress here. 16 years has gone by. Let's build this temple back. And the people were thrilled to do that. And then Zephaniah, or excuse me, Zechariah is another Z. This leads to the Messiah, the coming Messiah. We're getting very close to that time frame known as the 400 years of silence, which we'll talk about uh, two, uh, two lessons from now. And then finally, the very last one is Malachi, and we have the hearts of stone. And God's people needed their hearts to be touched in order uh, to repent of their sin. And that's the message that Malachi had. The very end of your lesson, I have on the back here, what should I know? There's a lot there, isn't there? But we've covered an awful lot of information. And I'm not saying that... Uh, that you are slacking off if you can't answer all these. That's not what I'm saying at all. This kind of gives us a guideline though. I think if you learned this information and reviewed it, it would give you a good foundation to the Old Testament. All right, we'll look forward to two weeks from tonight uh, covering the period of exile. Pastor, if you'll come. Do you not see some of the things that happen all the way back in the scripture, in the days of the scripture, and the things that are happening in our day today? Do you not see similarities? 
you know, leadership choices that people have made uh, have impacted generations to come. And we've made decisions in our country and elected leaders, and it's impacting the civilians all around us. You know, it's important that we make good choices and right decisions in our life, and uh, and uh, I thank the Lord for that good study. You know, it's amazing when you look at what is on the back of this sheet and all the information that uh, you have been taught. That's a lot of information in it. And what we are trying to do is honestly just give you a bird's eye picture. And if you had ever gone to a, uh, a Bible college and you were taking your first year, your Old Testament survey, uh, you would get something uh, similar to this, but this is probably a little more, a little more basic, but you're getting an overview of Scripture. We're going to give you one of the New Testament before long. It'll only be four lessons, and then we're going to come back in the weeks to come and add some more components to this, and I think you're in for a great, great treat. Uh, as we pray tonight and get dismissed, just a reminder, and I should have said this earlier, earlier. Next week, we will not have our regular uh, prayer band times, mission prayer band, because of the outreach effort. So I need to let our, make sure our, our prayer team leaders know that. We are going to have a prayer time in here for those that are not able to go out next week and do some canvassing for us and in, do, uh, do some invites. And I think the plan is, I'll double check with, um, with our staff, but I think the plan is to have some of these visits even available on Sunday because a lot of you live a good distance away. And we were trying, I, I guess is expensive. We understand that. So what we were thinking is instead of you having to come here and pick up the, the uh, place is that we were going to ask you to canvas, you could just go straight from your home and do that. And so we already have all of the, um, the uh, brochures that we're going to be handing out, and we'll have all that available, I think, on Sunday. So we'll try to say something about that, all right? So we're going to finish here and pray, and then we're going to go into our mission prayer band time. And I want to thank you for being here tonight. Lord, thank you so much for how our hearts have been challenged and stirred. And I thank you for Brother Ains putting the time and uh, effort into this this. And I pray that you would help us to be cognizant, Lord, of um, that decisions we make in life uh, have great, great consequences. And we think about many of those that were people in authority back in that day. And not only did it affect them, but it affected the entire nation because of choices. And may we always realize that uh, everything that we do affects others around us. And I pray that you would help us to walk with you and listen to you, to obey you, or to love you with all of our heart. Lord, tonight I pray for Miss um, uh, Robbie Dudley that was taken to the hospital just a few minutes ago. I pray you might touch this lady and uh, bring healing to her body. I pray for Jerry as he tries to uh, comfort her and as the doctors are attending to her even right now at Viden. I ask you to give them divine wisdom and uh, to best diagnose her. But most of all, God, I'm asking you to touch her for, with your hand. And Lord, as we move now to our time of prayer for our missionaries across the globe, I pray that uh, their burden would truly become our burden. Help us to bear burdens with them tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.